I'm so glad you could join us here and uh, to get back into studying the Word of God together. And uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, last time we're together, we finished uh, Psalm 23 together, looking at what our shepherd gives. Um, we're going to shift and, and go over and do a series through Habakkuk, uh, one of the small minor prophets uh, toward the end of the Old Testament, and, and see what he has to say. Um, the title of today's message is living in times of crisis and uh, it doesn't take much as we look around us to see the world in which we live there's a lot of uh, crisis a lot of violence going on especially in Minneapolis as we uh, see things unfold there with the violence in the street and uh, burning down of uh, businesses and neighborhoods and and people's hearts you know confused uh, frustrated uh, a lot of things going on there that we really don't know the full story yet, but uh, just a really seems like turmoil. And it's not only in Minneapolis, it's kind of around the world. We see uh, violence, we see rumors of wars, we, uh, we see um, pestilence, we see some countries now uh, in crisis over not only uh, COVID, but also um, with locusts uh, eating up crops. It seems like Around the world, there's there's crisis taking place. And as we look at uh, Habakkuk, he was one of the last uh, prophets uh, that was in the nation of Judah and uh, prophesied there and uh, told the nation that the Babylonians were going to come in and, and uh, overtake them. And uh, there was a lot of crisis that Habakkuk saw in his life. And we want to look at him and uh, how he responded uh, to the crisis around him. We're going to start in chapter 2 kind of an, as an introduction because chapter 2, uh, there's a phrase there we're going to look at, uh, the just shall live by faith. And if I was to say there was one key verse or thought of the whole three chapters of Habakkuk, it would be that, that the just shall live by faith. And in a time of crisis, um, we need to turn to our faith. We need to have our faith solidly planted in the Lord God. And as we do, uh, we can go through those times of crisis. We can make it through with a good testimony and uh, live a life that's uh, pleasing to the Lord, even despite uh, the chaos that seems to be going around us. And Habakkuk did just that. Um, he was uh, a shining example of goodness uh, in his nation as he represented the Lord and uh, spoke uh, to the nation of Israel. But Habakkuk wasn't without questions. Uh, he had his questions, chapters 1 and 2. He lays out a lot of questions uh, before the Lord. Um, and we have questions, and it's not necessarily wrong to ask questions of the Lord. That's how we, we learn. I guess it's our attitude in asking the questions. But Habakkuk just looked at the world around him, and he wanted to to know what was going on, what the Lord was doing. He just had some questions. And we'll we'll see some of that as we things unfold today in our, our time together. But uh, before we get into the text um, and uh, try to explain some of that, let's read the text together. We're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 2 and just the first four verses there. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation in that, and uh, so follow along if you have that. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait and see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. The vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives, they are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And the New King James puts it this way, but the just shall live by his faith. And uh, let's uh, pray and commit our time to the Lord. Father God, I thank you. I praise you for this study and this little book, Habakkuk. Uh, so many things that Habakkuk went through, so many things he saw, 
so many ways that he responded uh, to your working in his time and his culture. Some similar questions that we have today as we look at the violence around us, we look at the chaos. Uh, we have some of the same questions that Habakkuk would have. We're asking, Lord, what are you doing? How are you accomplishing your will? How are you building your church in the midst of all this chaos? And uh, Lord, help us to find answers for those questions we have, just like Habakkuk did, going to you, uh, coming to you in prayer, seeking your wisdom. And so Lord, help us to do likewise. Uh, be with us today as we look at this text and start our journey uh, through this uh, wonderful book of prophecy and help us to glean some things from Habakkuk's world that we can apply to our own. And we ask it all in your wonderful name. Amen. As I said before, Habakkuk is, is one of the uh, prophets toward the tail end of Judah's history before they were uh, carried away into captivity. Uh, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Nahum, um, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah, uh, other prophets uh, during Judah's time. And he was uh, prophesying during the reigns of King Josiah. He was one of the last righteous kings of Judah. Uh, from 640 to 609 BC. And he was also um, prophesying during Jehoiakim's reign in 609 to 598. Um, at that time, Assyria was losing uh, her power and her strength, and, and Babylon was rising um, as a growing military threat uh, in the world in which Habakkuk lived. And Nebuchadnezzar had uh, defeated Egypt in 605 and and uh, was stretching her muscles again and, and he wanted to attack then attack Judah and uh, Jeremiah had announced to the nation of Israel uh, he had told them that Babylon would invade them that uh, they would come into Jerusalem they'd destroy the city they would level the temple and he and Jeremiah announced this to the to the people and not only that, he would come, Nebuchadnezzar would come in, and he would take the people and exile them, take many of them and exile them into Babylon itself, and that they would have to assimilate into the uh, culture of Babylon. And uh, this happened in 606 to 586 BC. It was many years taking place, but Eventually, Jerusalem was overcome, the temple was destroyed, and the people were brought away into exile. And Judah, during this time period, as Habakkuk um, prophesies to them, uh, tells them what's going to take place, reinforcing what Jeremiah had uh, previously told them. And uh, Judah thought uh, that the Lord would overlook uh, her sins, that uh, the Lord would kind of wink an eye at what was going on there and overlook what was taking place in their country. But uh, David reminds us in Psalm 31 and verse 23, David says this, Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. And even though Israel was God's chosen people, they were filled with pride. They thought they could get away with, with anything. And so God had to show them, even through a, a wicked nation of Babylon, send them in to Jerusalem to defeat them. And that was one of the questions Habakkuk had, is, Lord, how can you use a nation that in some ways is much more wicked than we are to judge us? And so Habakkuk had that question, and God would, would speak to him. Uh, within the text of Habakkuk's book, uh, we can clearly see that he knew the scripture well. Um, Habakkuk was a competent uh, theologian. Um, he had a great faith in the Lord. Um, and just because he had questions didn't mean he had, didn't have faith. He just wanted to, to make sure, what are you doing, Lord, so I can be a part of what you're doing? He had a great faith in the Lord God. And, and because of the psalm or, or the song that Habakkuk gives us in, in chapter 3, some scholars believe that uh, uh, he may have been a priest who led worship in the temple. And if so, like 
Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, he was a priest that was called to be a prophet. And oftentimes, sometimes God has us doing one thing and then he calls us to do something else. And, and so he did in the life of Habakkuk. Habakkuk's name, it's interesting. A lot of Hebrew uh, names that were given to uh, the people um, had meanings to them. And Habakkuk's name means to embrace or to wrestle. And, and in this book, he was doing both. Um, he was embracing, he was wrestling and embracing. Um, he wrestled with God uh, concerning the problem of uh, holy God could use a wicked nation like Babylon uh, to chasten uh, the people of Israel. He, he, had, he wrestled with that. Lord, how can you use someone even more wicked than we are to judge us? He also wrestles with the spiritual decline of his nation and, and why God didn't appear to be doing something about it. He saw his, the culture, he saw the society in which he lived just unraveling at the seams. Uh, there was violence. Uh, uh, there was, was people um, doing things that were even more wicked than, than the pagans of the time. There were human sacrifices he saw all this thing taking place. He saw cruelty in society. He saw injustice. And, and so he asked, Lord, what are you doing? What? How come you're not doing anything in our society? Why aren't you bringing revival to your nation? And he thought God had, had abandoned uh, Judah and, and to the contrary. And so, so we see Habakkuk wrestling uh, with these things. And, and he desired to see revival uh, in his country. In chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. And so he's saying, Lord, pour out your mercy upon us. Bring revival to your your nation. Change the hearts of your people. And so we see that even in his wrestling, Habakkuk had a desire to see his people grow and to become more like God. And, and he, he wondered, Lord, why aren't you bringing revival? Uh, Corey Ten Boone, she said this, I, I love this. She said, faith is like radar that sees through the fog the reality of things at a distance that the human eye cannot see. In other words, sometimes we're looking, we're seeing our society around us. We see things taking place. It's foggy. We can't see how God is working. We can't see that he's even working at all at times. Sometimes we wonder, Lord, what's, what's taking place in Minneapolis? What are you you're doing there in the violence there? Why isn't there, there justice being brought? And sometimes we see things, you might say, through the fog, but there is God's doing something there. And I, I thought about that this morning. Uh, sometimes we, we plant seeds, right? We, I planted some seeds uh, to start some plants for uh, my garden, and I waited till uh, they were supposed to germinate and come up, and it was two days afterwards. There was no sign of of any plants, and this was on a Friday, and so um, I go home, I had them here in my office, and I'm thinking, wow, next Monday I'll just have to put some new seed in. They must have been bad seed. The next Monday I come back, and there's two-inch plants sticking out of the soil. You see, I didn't think anything was going on there. I thought the seed was dead, but there was life there, and then it comes and displays itself. Sometimes God's like that. He's doing things in our life. He's doing things in our nation's life. He's doing things in the church, and we can't really see what he's doing. And we wonder, what are you doing, Lord? Are you doing anything at all? But then he displays the things that he's doing, and he oftentimes does that. And so Habakkuk wrestled with things before God, and he also embraced, part of his, na his name means to embrace God or to, 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 to come to God. And, and by faith, he embraces or clings to, you might say, the promises of God. As, as chapter 
part of chapter two and three unfold, he starts to embrace, he puts his faith in God. He realizes God is doing something in the heart of Judah, things that he can't even see, but he places his faith in the promises that God has made. I love Isaac Watts. He said this, I believe the promises of God enough to venture an eternity on them. So, and that's the same way we're to be. We're, we're to trust in the promises of God so much that we, we bank our whole eternity on it, that what God says is going to take place. And, and I've been asked that before. How can you say that you're going to heaven? How can you say with a surety? Well, I can say that because I trust in the promises of God, that when I came to Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior, the word of God promises me that he gives me, he imparts to me as a gift, eternal life. And what's the end of eternity? It's forever, isn't it? So I can trust in the promises of God, God and you can too. You can trust in what God says. Well, Habakkuk's statement in verse 4, the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God, or as the New King James says, the just shall live by faith. Uh, it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Uh, in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and in Hebrews 10.38. In Romans, the emphasis is on the just, in Galatians, it's how we should live our life. And in Hebrews, the focus is on faith. You might say it takes three books to explain this one verse. The just shall live by faith. Um, R.C. Sproul said this. I love this. He said, the issue of faith is not so much whether we believe in God, but whether we believe the God we believe in. It goes beyond just saying, I believe there is a God, but do you believe in him? Do you believe in what he says? Do you believe in his promises? Do you have faith in what he says? And that's what faith is about. I believe what he says, and that's what Habakkuk, he wrestled with that. God, you said this, but it appears you're doing this, and I wonder what's going on. And so Habakkuk had to have a conversation with God, and God revealed to him, what he was doing and basically told Habakkuk, you need to trust in me. You need to place your faith in me. Even though you can't see clearly what's going on, I am working. I am there. And sometimes in our own lives, we wrestle with that, don't we? We don't see God actively working in our lives. We don't feel like he's working in our life. But we're told that the righteous shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so we need to have faith that God is, is working in our lives. Oswald Chambers put it this way, faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. And I ask you this, do you, do you love, do you know the one who is leading you? Do you trust that he is, is worthy? He is trustworthy? You can trust in him? That's what faith is about. I trust. I, I, I believe that and love the one who is leading me. We just had a series about the shepherd, Jesus Christ, and, and how he's there to, to lavish us with great gifts and how he guides us and takes care of us. Do you love him? If you love him, you'll trust in him. You'll, you'll trust in his leading in your life. Pastor Jack Wellman put it this way. I love this. Faith is it's all about what we cannot see. We believe in God by faith and we get saved by faith. But sometimes the hardest part of faith is living through hardships day by day when we can't see a way out. But, he goes on to say, but we can trust God by faith to always be with us. We may not be able to see God tangibly with our eyes. We may not be able to feel him at times present in our lives, but we can trust in his promises that he will always be with us. Jesus said, I will be with my sheep until the end of all ages. And we can trust in the promise of God. And Habakkuk was learning this lesson of trust, of faith, of, of living by faith. In, in a world that was filled with crisis for him. 
And when we read Habakkuk in the light of the whole Bible, we can see Jesus Christ as the center of its overall message. In light of the spiritual crisis that we are facing today, it can, can help us to see that there are three things that we need to prepare ourselves so we won't drift or, or walk away from Christ, so that we won't lose faith in the eternal providential care of our Heavenly Father. There's some things that the Habakkuk tells us we need here. First of all, he tells us that we must be alert. Notice that he, he says there in chapter 2 in verse 1, he says, I will climb up my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait and see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. We need to be in our watchtower, you might say. We need to be in our guard post. We need to be knowledgeable of our culture and the times in which we live. It's, it's no time to seclude ourselves, to, to, to hide ourselves from the world and retreat from the battle. That's what the enemy wants. He, he doesn't want us to be on the forefront. He doesn't want us to be out doing battle for justice, for righteousness, for those things which are, are pleasing to God. He wants us to retreat. He doesn't want us to be reaching out and loving our neighbors. No, he doesn't want us. He, he wants us to retreat, but we need to be alert. We need to be knowledgeable of what's going on in the world around us. Habakkuk saw the collapse of the kingdom of Judah. And then a few years later, Judah would be conquered by the Babylonians. You might say it was the beginning of the end for the nation. And when Habakkuk would open the, the window of his house... Literally, when he would look out, he could see violence and, and injustice in the streets. When he talked to people, he was exposed to, to conflicts and, and strife. Uh, when he would visit uh, the courts, he would constantly uh, see the law being twisted and perverted. He would see injustices take place where innocent people would be condemned and, and hurt. Sound familiar? Sound like a world in which we live in? Uh, his spiritual eyes, you might say, were, were totally awake. He was looking at his culture, observing what was going on. And Habakkuk was in tune with his culture. He knew what was happening around him. And his, his heart was, was breaking over the condition of his people. Where's your heart? Your heart breaking over the condition of the people around you? Of those without Christ? Those that are, are feeling hopeless, that are confused, that are frustrated, uh, that justice has, has been taken away from someone. Well, we see this all around us in the world in which we live. Well, fast forward a few centuries from Habakkuk, and, and, and Jesus was on the scene. Jesus saw things even more clearly than Habakkuk did. Habakkuk could see the consequences and the, the effects of the crisis, but Jesus could point out the root cause of the crisis. He could see deeper than what Habakkuk could see. Habakkuk could see the expression of what was going on in the culture around him, but Jesus could look down deep within the human heart, and he could see the human heart, the wickedness of it which would give rise to, to all sorts of problems that, that plague the world in which we live in. But Jesus knew the depths of the problem. It was a heart issue. It, it was a heart that was corrupted, a heart that was fallen away from God, a heart that was, was desperately wicked, as Jeremiah puts it. It was a heart that, that needed to be transformed. Habakkuk could see the national crisis. Jesus pointed out the global crisis. There's a global crisis. There's a global need for salvation. There's a global need for Jesus Christ and, and the transformed heart that only he can give. Jesus could see that. Habakkuk could see the outward crisis or cultural condition. Jesus could look within the human heart and, and see the devastating power of sin that was destroying humanity. 
And not only could he see the, how it was destroying humanity, he could see the problem, but he had a solution for it. The solution was himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come unto the Father except by me. He is a solution for sin. He is the perfect sacrifice that was made for sin. And when you place your, your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you, admitting your sinfulness, turning from that sinfulness and turning to him, he renews your heart. He takes care of the the problem, the root problem that every one of us have. And that's a corrupt, wicked heart. And he transforms that heart and makes it pure. And only he can. And so he is the answer for that problem. Each generation confronts its own crises. Uh, I often counsel with people who are tragically affected by the present day spiritual crisis. People who come from broken families, people in unstable, violent relationships, people who find it difficult to imagine their future, hearts that are filled with, with hopelessness. They're giving up. I, I see all this. I've seen it over the years in my counseling. And they're just feeling hopeless, not realizing that the solution to their problem is right before them, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you some questions. Do you have eyes that are open to the spiritual crisis in your family, in your town, in, in your, your workplace? Are, do you have eyes that are open to the crisis that's going on, the, the spiritual crisis that's there? Can you grasp the longing and the despair of the human heart. Can you sense it in, in the lives of people around you? Are you tuned into the spiritual climate of, of your community, of the culture uh, in which you, you live? Then I ask this question, what can we do about it? What can we do about it? That's a question we need to answer. How do we respond? I think our main task or starting point is to map out biblically what's going on in the world around us and to seek out relevant ways to, to speak to our generation. And I think that journey starts with presenting them the solution to their problem, Jesus Christ, and how he can transform their, their human hearts. You see, Habakkuk there's something else we need to do. We not only need to be alert, but we need to follow the example of, of Habakkuk and the prophets in, the, in times past. Habakkuk was a prophet in two ways. First of all, he had a message from God to the people. You and I have a message from God to the people the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And, and just like Habakkuk, we need to take the message of, of the word of God of salvation and bring it to the people, just like Habakkuk did. We need to follow his example. Habakkuk also had something to say to God. He opened his, his heart to God, expressing all his anxiety and his questions about the situations around him. Not only do we have a message to bring to people, but we need to be communicating to God as we do that. We need to come to God in prayer. We need to seek his wisdom. We need to seek him as we bring the message, just like Habakkuk did. He come to God. He received the word of God. Then he spoke it to people. And we need to be doing the same thing. He had an ear toward the, the will of God and, and another ear toward the, the cries of the people around him. He was communicating with God, and as he heard the cries of the people, he would come before the Lord and seek wisdom from him. How, Lord, do I speak to this people? And you and I, just like Habakkuk, we need to, to bring that message he's given to us to the world around us, to the culture around us. It's the only answer. It's the only answer to what's going on in Minneapolis. The violence there is just a reflection of what's going on in the human heart. And the only thing that can bring peace to Minneapolis and to the hearts of those who are bringing this violence is the peace that comes from Jesus Christ through salvation in him alone. That's the answer. And we need to bring that to people. We need to not only follow after 
Well, Habakkuk's example, we need to follow Jesus. Follow his example. Jesus proclaimed the will of God. When he come to this world, he proclaimed the will of God. And when he came, he said that he didn't want these little ones to perish. In Luke 19.10, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, right? That's the will of God, to seek and to save that which is lost. In John 6.39, Jesus said this, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise them up in the last days. That's God's will. Jesus proclaims God's will to us. Jesus prayed for his sheep. You think we should be praying for each other? We should be lifting each other? We need to be following Jesus' example, living after the will of God, praying for each other. Jesus said this in John 17, 14 through 16, he said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. See, Jesus prayed for the followers. He prayed not to take them out of this world, but he prayed that they would have strength to go through this world. We need to be praying for each other, following Jesus' example, proclaiming the will of God to the world, praying for each other. And, and he did far, far more than that. Habakkuk only spoke about the crisis. Jesus, as prophet and high priest, spoke about the crisis, and he gave his life to rescue us from it, giving hope to those who trust in him. You and I are to love people so much that we would even be willing, like Jesus, to give our lives for other people, to, to step in and to invest our lives in the lives of other people. And sometimes that's hard. I know I've spent a lot of times investing my life in, in some people lately. And some of those people just have walked away. They don't want it. They're, they're rejecting it. And, and, you know, like Jesus, I can't give up on them. I need to keep praying for them. I need to keep reaching out to them, just like Jesus does to me every single day. He doesn't give up on me. And so we need to follow Jesus' example. We need to, to listen to what he has to say and, and follow after, after him. Now, I want to leave you with this today. I want to leave with this from Hebrews chapter 13. Starting in verse 19, it says this, But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that is my prayer for you is that you will have a growing desire in your heart to follow after Jesus. Just like Habakkuk, come to God. He had questions, and he come to God. He trusted in God's promises. His faith grew, and he followed God, and he faithfully proclaimed the message of salvation to the nation of Judah. Likewise, I'm praying that you and I will follow after the will of God and allow him to work in us in such a way that we'll have a growing love for people around us, people in great crisis and need, and that you and I would be courageous, step out and offer Jesus Christ the solution to their crisis. May you and I be faithful to Jesus. In his wonderful name, I ask it. 